Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Maya Loria with TMC for Seniors. And today we are starting our October off with uh, the theme of For the Health of It. Um, today we've got Michael Urquhart here. He is an exercise physiologist with our TMC Cardiac Rehab Program. And he's going to be talking about improving muscle strength. So welcome, Michael. Hello, everybody. How are you? Thanks, Maya. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you. We'd love to have you on, Mike, and it's it's great. Um, you always have some really good information uh, for our seniors, and I know that you're going to provide a lot of that today. Excellent. Yes, and I will. So um, I, I guess I'll just go ahead and start. Please. So muscle strength is so important to our body, and I know uh, those of you who have heard me talk before, we've you know, almost all of my talks start with muscle strength, then we talk about diet, then we talk about cardiac stuff and everything. And so what I really want to try to do is really focus on um, why we need to increase our muscle strength and how it affects all the other systems of our body, especially our cardiac, um, our cardiovascular system. Now, uh, like Maya said, I do work with uh, TMC and TMC cardiac rehab. And the main reason for cardiac rehab is to increase the overall cardiovascular capacity and muscle strength of those that have had any sort of cardiac issue. Um, for a long time, people that have these cardiac issues, they don't know that they have a cardiac issue until they really notice something acutely. But in that time, prior to that acute situation, people are gradually losing strength, they're losing focus, they're losing their ability to do things that they had been doing all along. Well, a lot of that just comes from that deconditioning, just due to that loss in strength. So it's very important to maintain your muscle strength at all times. Now, I do like uh, to talk about, you know, first of all, your muscle mass. What does your muscle mass do for you? Well, your muscle mass gives you your gives you your body control. Your muscle mass also helps to stabilize your metabolism. You know, you've always heard the higher your muscle mass, the higher your metabolism. Well, it, that is true, but your metabolism is both uh, catabolic and um, anabolic respiration kind of mixed into one. And so you're trying to offset that catabolic process by, by continuing to build or uh, continuing to improve that anabolic process. And one of the best ways to do that is by increasing your muscle mass. And there's several, several, and you know, um, we've talked about this before, there's several types of exercises that you can do to help increase your muscle mass. You know, you can do strength training, you can do resistance training, you can do um, any just basic exercises to help improve your muscle mass. The best exercise that we like to promote, especially with cardiac rehab, is walking. Walking was coined, um, it's actually a famous quote by Hippocrates, that walking is man's best, uh, best medicine. And the reason for that, it improves your cardiovascular system while at the same time stimulating muscle growth of the large muscle groups of the lower body, your legs, your calves, your, you know, your feet, everything, so that you are more structurally sound. Being more structurally sound helps you to improve your balance as well. When you have more tonal strength, your balance improves. And so when you're talking about improving your muscle strength, that's what we're talking about. Your heart. Your heart is a muscle. You have to continue to work your heart. I know your heart works passively every day, but you have to stimulate your heart to get more out of it. Doing uh, a modicum of exercise, cardiovascular exercise every day, anywhere from, I'm going to say, 20 to 45 minutes of sustained cardiovascular exercise is doing wonders for your heart. And if you have the ability to do that, please do so every day. So anyways, now the other thing that we can go into uh, about improving your muscle mass is that your muscles, just like any other 
uh, organ tissue in your body requires energy for it to function. And by requiring this energy, your body provides those muscles with fat, believe it or not. While you are at rest, the preferred source of energy for your muscle is fat. And this is the aerobic uh, fuel for your muscle. When you're at higher intensities of exercise, your body, your muscles then rely a little bit more on carbohydrate. But it's not mutually exclusive. You don't burn fat all at once and you don't burn uh, carbohydrates all at once or um, in a lot of uh, the mainstream settings, sugars or glucose or anything like that. Your body is always burning a mixture. So the reason why I bring this up is because of this molecule called HDL. HDL is high density lipoproteins. These high density lipoproteins will carry unused fat and cholesterol products that are not being used by the muscle back to the liver for processing. There's another molecule that works in opposition of HDL and that's LDL, low density lipoprotein. This low density lipoprotein carries fat and cholesterol to the working muscles. And so that's how the muscles get their energy. Now when you have a low HDL and a high LDL or vice versa, high LDL and low HDL, what in a sense that extra LDL is not going to be reprocessed. It's actually going to start adhering to the walls of your blood vessels and that starts forming what we call atherosclerosis or plaque on your arteries. And it's that plaque or atherosclerosis that uh, tends to grow and grow over years, over the years and starts forming those blockages that your cardiologist typically looks at and determines whether or not you're going to need a stent or whether or not you're going to need bypass grafting because the, the arteries are so occluded. And it's easily, it can be easily, sorry, I, should, I, I shouldn't say uh, easily controlled, but it can be easily controlled just by increasing your muscle mass, just by increasing your exercise. By increasing that exercise, you increase that molecule of HDL that will return that LDL back to the liver for reprocessing and eventually elimination. So um, can you go to the next slide, I think, Maya? Um, well, okay. <laughs> so, so maybe even the next slide I just talked about too. But so as you see here, uh, it's the LDL that's kind of dumping the, the fatty deposits into the blood vessels, but it's the HDL that's picking it up and taking it back to the liver for processing. And all of that can be improved, that you can improve that HDL by increasing your muscle mass. So are there any questions at this point? It seems like I'm a little bit off track, but I will answer any questions that someone might have. Maya, if you have any questions, that'd be great too. I, I, I don't have any questions that have come in yet, but I do love the slide. <laughs> so. I know. It's great, isn't it? Isn't that a great slide? Yeah, so, it's fun. <laughs> I mean, it really, it really tells a story as to what is happening over a course of time where, you know, once again, so it's the LDL particles. Once they start adhering to the blood vessel wall, they become oxidized. And I don't know if we've talked about this in any other presentation, but those LDL particles become oxidized. And this leads, lends credence to the fact why we need to eat a lot of antioxidants. And I don't mean um, in vitamin form or in supplement form. I mean actually eating fruits and vegetables because fruits and vegetables carry with them a lot of antioxidants. Now, and I probably should go back a little bit further, too, and tell you the difference between an oxidation product and an antioxidant. Well, an oxidizer is simply a molecule that creates a free electron that will react wildly with any other sort of molecule, causing that molecule either to become um, uh, denatured or somehow damaged, and therefore it can't do the job that it should. And so it's up to the antioxidants to actually bond to that free radical, that's what it's called, bond to that free radical to, um, to make it so that they can't cause the damage. And so therefore, by eating more antioxidants, 
you're creating a protective, uh, uh, I don't know, protective shield against the oxidation products. And so one of the things that are happening in your blood vessel wall is that LDL is becoming oxidized. And if we can somehow slow down that oxidation process, then we can slow down the buildup of the fatty products in your blood vessel walls or the, the growth of atherosclerosis. So that's why I really like this. The picture, you know, it's hard to read all of that into that picture, but that's what's happening. Um, and then the LDL particles are able to take those products back to the liver for reprocessing. And Mike, can you maybe give some examples of some good antioxidants that somebody might want to eat? Oh, great. Yeah. So antioxidants appear in a couple of different forms. Um, antioxidants can be your water soluble vitamins. One of the biggest wa water soluble vitamins, antioxidant water soluble vitamins is vitamin C. I mean, it's just, you know, just that, just that simple. And, you know, vitamin C is in a lot of fruits and vegetables. So uh, the other sort of antioxidant is in the, um, I'm sorry, in the uh, uh, non-water soluble or uh, like fat soluble uh, phase as well. And those are some of your oils. Uh, some of the good oils, you know, that we've heard all the time are your um, omega, omega threes, omega sixes, your omega nine fatty acids. And those are the antioxidant sorts of products as well. Vitamin E oil, that's, you know, a great topical antioxidant as well. And uh, let's see, and the other sorts of antioxidants are in mineral form, just like selenium. And selenium is really high in different types of nuts. So there you have it right there. All of a sudden, I've talked about all of the good foods that you should be eating. You know, those uh, omega, omega threes, omega sixes, omega nines, you know, your fish. Yeah, fish. Um, those are very high in those uh, omega fatty acids. And then uh, when we talk about the selenium, you know, which is very high, uh, it's a mineral. You know, we're talking about your nuts, your beans, your all of those sorts of, um, I, you know, I'll go ahead and say sorts of vegetables as well. And then, of course, um, then you have all your vegetables, you know, that are just high in vitamin C. You name one vegetable that doesn't have vitamin C, um, I will try to wager it against you. But I can't think of one right now. Okay. But, yeah. So, um, basically, this is just another... A picture kind of illustrating what's going on with HDL and LDL and how they interact. Now, the biggest thing about that HDL, the HDL, you can improve, you can raise the amount of HDL by improving your muscle strength, by growing muscle. Muscle, okay, so muscle is one of those organs that uh, the size component of the muscle actually directly um, directly correlated with the amount of strength it can produce. And when a muscle contracts, meaning it gets shortened, it produces a force. And by producing that force, that causes you to lift stuff, that causes you to walk, that causes you to do whatever you need to do against the force of gravity. And so by increasing the mass, increasing the size, you've actually made your life easier because now something that was that felt like five pounds you know two days ago after two days of lifting then that five pounds is now easier for you to lift and while you're doing that activity you're actually using up a little bit more energy so and then that gets to the point of maintaining your weight uh, maintaining your weight through increasing your muscle mass just a larger muscle mass there's a higher um, catabolic component too. And the catabolic component means the breakdown of stored energy materials like fat and like uh, glycogen, which is the stored form of glucose in your body. Now, um, the other thing I kind of want to talk about when you increase your muscle strength is maintaining your glucose levels. I mean, it's so hard to talk about any of this stuff without talking about your heart, without talking about your diet, without talking about your muscles. <clears throat> and now what I'm going to talk about is maintaining 
your glucose levels. I'm not saying anything about diabetes. I'm not saying anything about diabetes because so many people have high glucose levels and they don't even know they're diabetic. It's only after uh, a physician does a blood draw and says, hey, your A1C or your uh, uh, glycosylated hemoglobin levels are above 5.5. And that's when they say, hey, you know what? You're pre-diabetic. You've got to get your blood glucose levels down. And then they do a finger stick and they take a sample of your blood glucose and lo and behold, your resting blood glucose level is 140. Resting or fasting blue glucose uh, blood levels above 120 says uh, it's a red flag. It's like, wait a second, something's going on here. So by increasing your muscle mass, i.e. increasing your muscle strength, that helps bring, that, bring down that fasting blood glucose level over time. The more you activate that muscle tissue, the more hungry those uh, muscles get for that glucose as well. And so that causes a decrease in your blood glucose levels. And over time, your A1Cs typically become lower in the 5 range. 4.5 to 5 is fantastic if you can get it there. Now, I know, you're asking, okay, so what does high blood glucose levels do to me or hyperglycemia? And, you know, once again, I don't want to get too far away from the improvements um, by increasing your muscle mass, what that does for you uh, overall. But I, it's, once again, it's hard to talk about. So by reducing your A1Cs or getting out of that position where you are hyperglycemic all the time, you actually reduce the chances of all the, the diabetic sorts of diseases like retinopathy. Have you heard of that? Retinopathy? Um, how about uh, nephropathy? No. How about microangiopathy? How about, there's one more. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Um, it's all the, um, but anyways, uh, and that's simply because it has really not too much to do with atherosclerosis, but it has to do with the thickening of your blood vessels, especially the capillaries. And this thickening is not related to atherosclerosis at all. It is the, the, gosh, the, the lumen of the blood vessel the inside of the blood vessel becomes more narrowed. And so that makes it harder for blood to pass through. By increasing your muscle strength, increasing your muscle mass, you can actually decrease your hyperglycemia, which will overall decrease your A1C. That's short for um, hem uh, glycosylated hemoglobin, by the way. Sorry about that. I don't know if I said that earlier. But anyways, um, and when you do that, you actually are putting yourself in a more healthy situation. And all that is by improving your muscle strength. Just getting out, lifting some weights will cause that. We'll do that. Um, oh, ne uh, neuropathy. That was the last one I was thinking of. Wow, that was one of the easiest ones, too. So <laughs> neuropathy. And, uh, you know, a lot of these things people have. Some people, it's, all, it's now being thought of as, uh, fibromyalgia, the kind of strange nebulous disease that people are always aching all the time. They're now thinking that that's kind of related to hyperglycemia or chronic high blood glucose levels, but someone that is not diagnosed with diabetes. And this is what leads to that tingling, that aching, that kind of, I don't know, like pins and needles of neuropathy. And, you know, when we start talking about peripheral neuropathy and all of those things are all related to high blood glucose levels. Um, let's see, nephropathy is actually the start of kidney disease. When you get those narrowed blood vessels in your kidneys, then you really start damaging your glomular filtration unit. And that's the smallest active unit of your kidney. That's what actually filters your blood and filters out all the bad stuff and keeps the good stuff. And when those blood vessels are compromised in your kidneys, then you start filtering out stuff that you shouldn't be filtering. And so that leads to kidney disease. 
And of course, the microangiopathy, well, that's the narrowing of blood vessels all over your body. And that includes the blood vessels of your heart. And of course, if that's combined with atherosclerotic plaque, then we start having issues with coronary artery disease. Hey, do I need to tell you to go out there and do some strength training? I don't think I do now, do I? Um, but anyways, go out there and do it. Make yourself stronger. But um, let's see, any questions? Or maybe even the next slide too. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna oh, go down well, here, yeah. right? Yeah, still the H LDL, HDL. I think I think a little bit further down, there is something about. Well, we can we ah. can actually share these slides afterwards, Mike, so that sure. people can go back to watch them. Um, here's actually I have a I did have a question come in asking about someone who might exercise daily, but they've now become deconditioned within the past eighteen months, okay. um, due to not due to a non cardiac injury. Would you recommend that they seek out a physical therapist for resting muscle imbalances, for resulting muscle imbalances? Sorry about that. Whew. Wow, that's a good question. So, I, you know, I can never tell someone not to seek out additional medical care. That is, that's a great idea. A physical therapist can give you a baseline as to what you can do and maybe what you shouldn't do. Um, some of the things, especially when you become deconditioned, uh, your joints become imbalanced. And I think you had even said that in your question. But uh, those muscular imbalances can lead to joint injury if you start back your exercise too fast, too much, too soon. And so going to a physical therapist, they can actually give you a wide range of tests to see what your flexibility is flexibility is to see what your baseline strength is to tell you where to go from there. Um, if you do have some questions about where to start. So, and, yes. And would you, how long does it take Mike for somebody to maybe be deconditioned? I mean, if oh you, boy. cause you know, that, that seems to happen. Sometimes it seems pretty fast. It, like it if does. You've been working out and you've been maybe, lifting some weights and, and whatnot, and then if you stop, how long does it typically take to for that to happen? That's such a good question. So, and I can answer this two ways. The more in shape you are, like if you're just getting ready to compete in the Olympics at your specified sport, and you take a day off or you know a couple of days off of training, you can become deconditioned very quickly. You will not be at that same level of fitness that you were prior to. Now, overall, to become deconditioned, you know, you can lose uh, about one to 10% of your strength every week that you do not exercise, depending on where you stop, where you stop exercising. And it also depends on if you become bedridden or if you, you know, stop riding your bicycle, you stop or you stop walking, but you still maintain a very low level of activity. And that's re really determines how deconditioned you become. When I see patients in the hospital, um, a lot of those patients, I mean, from one day to the next day, you can tell that there is anywhere from five to 10% deconditioning from the day before, just because they have been in the bed, you know, 12 hours, you know, 24 hours straight. You can lose that much muscle mass, that much conditioning in that period of time. So yeah, it, does, it happens very quickly. Wow, okay, thank you. Thank you. I, so I know we have up now about types of exercise. So I think that this is a great, great slide for you to talk about more about types of exercises that would be helpful. Sure. So, you know, and once again, coming from the cardiac uh, standpoint, uh, aerobic exercises are some of my go-to exercises for people just because it builds muscle strength at the same time that it builds your overall cardiovascular strength. And so when, once again, it's hard to separate, you know, it's hard to separate the two just by trying to build your overall strength. It, that's it. 
<laughs> that's the way to go is the aerobic exercise. And of course, there's several different types of aerobic exercise. Like I said earlier, if you can walk, that is the best exercise for you. Just get out and walk. Just do that. Everybody that's listening to me right now, the weather is beautiful right now. This is why we live here in Arizona. It's because of this weather that we are experiencing right now. This afternoon at 5 o'clock, stop what you're doing. I don't care what you're doing, except, except if you're driving your car. Sorry. Stop what you're doing and go out and do a 10 to 15-minute walk. That's all you need to do. If you can do that every day, you're going to be golden. Okay. So you don't like to walk. Your feet hurt. I don't know. You want to go further? Get on your bicycle. I know bicycles in the last year or so have been hard to come by, but you don't have to have the latest, the sleekest, the best bicycle out there. Any bike will do. Get out and ride your bike. And same thing. You know, do you have to ride El Tour to Tucson? No. You know, five, six, seven, eight miles. That's really all you need to do, even if that. And don't even think about your, your distance. Think about the time, just like I said about walking. You know, ride your bike 30 minutes. That's it. That's all you have to do. Uh, swimming, you know, now we're getting into a little bit more technical type of activity. But if you like to swim, this is a great opportunity. Swimming is a great cardiovascular exercise. Now, I'm not knocking you swimmers out there. I love to swim myself. I swim three days a week. But swimming, as far as a muscle builder, um, it's not quite the same as the gravity uh, gravity fighting exercises like walking or cycling or anything like that, just because uh, the force of gravity is not reacting on the body. But it is a great exercise for core strength. Swimming is great for core. Um, it doesn't require gravity to work on your core. You can, you know, basically you're utilizing your internal musculature to maintain certain form and function while you're producing the swimming activity. Uh, hiking, you know, just like walking, you're just changing the terrain a little bit more, um, increasing some obstacles, which greatly improves your balance and coordination. And just like in to further improve your uh, balance and coordination, dancing. I mean, dancing is always a good time. I mean, um, clear out some furniture in your house. A turn up your radio. You can dance to classical music if you want to. I've done it. Um, yeah, just don't anger your neighbors by turning your music up too loud. So really, um, that's uh, those are some of the more basic aerobic exercises that you can do. Of course, there's all different other types of exercises out there. Now, as far as resistance exercises or um, weight training exercises, utilizing some heavy object or like a stretch band to improve your muscle strength. That's fantastic as well. And there are thousands of different resistance training exercises. A total body strength training program is probably best for the majority of the population out there. And when you start doing a resistance training program like that, you want to think about the major muscle groups of your body, you know, starting with the larger muscle groups like your legs and then your back, then your chest, your shoulders, your arms to include your biceps and your triceps. And really that's, that is a basic full body weight training program. And you can look up exercises that will um, that will hit all those major muscle groups. And like I said before, there are thousands of them. Um, you can't really go wrong with any of them. Some you're going to like, some you're not going to like. Um, reps and weight and sets, you know, just start off really basic. You know, one set of you know, 15 to 18 reps of a weight that you can do for 15 to 18 reps. Or if you're learning the form, maybe no weight at all. Just learn the form of the exercise. Then gradually increase the weight as you improve with the form as well. So, yeah. Um, exercise, weight training. Don't 
do it. Oh, what is the uh, what's the word? I can't think of the word, but enjoy it. Have fun with it. Don't do it begrudgingly. That's the word. Don't do it begrudgingly. Oh, Mike said I had to do this. No, no, you know, <laughs> you don't. Well, I, I think you need to do it, but don't go into it like that. Do it because you want to do it, and that makes it so much more fun. Um, exercise overall is supposed to be a stress reliever. It's not supposed to put more stress on you. Um, exercise is a great way to reduce your stress, to help you, I don't know, just to help you relax. Yeah, I know you sweat a little bit, you get out of breath a little bit. Some people don't find that very comfortable, but it's only for a few minutes. And the more you do it, the better you feel, guaranteed. I know, I know. So, Mike, can you tell us, can you make sure that um, we're not pushing our body too far? How, how, how can we make sure that we're just doing the right amount of exercise? Oh, boy. Yeah, that's a good question. How do you know if you're going too far? Well, first of all, the only thing I can tell you is to do something, first of all. Do something. I don't care what it is. Then listen to your body afterwards, either right after the exercise or the next day after the exercise. Now, weight training exercises, since we've been talking about increasing your muscle mass, resistance exercise can tend to make you feel uncomfortable the next day just because of some of the things that are brought about, some of the physiological changes that happen in your body while you are doing resistance training. Now, if you do too much, you might have an increased level of discomfort the next day. But expect some discomfort the next day. But if it's so much that you can't carry on normal activity the next day, you probably did too much. Now, how to tell someone um, right now who I don't know what's too much and what is not enough, it, it's hard to do. I, I couldn't do it. The only thing I can tell you is to just do something. I don't want to tell you not to do anything for fear of hurting yourself because hurt and discomfort are two different things. There's going to be some discomfort afterwards, but the more you do it, the less discomfort there's going to be. I, I think, I, I don't know, does that answer that for you? Yeah, I mean, I know sometimes people feel that they may they may be afraid of pushing themselves. Um, sure. You know, particularly somebody who might have some cardiac, who has had some cardiac issues, and I know that that is oftentimes a fear. Sure, of, sure, sure. You know, how much should you do, and how much should you? Well, you know, how how do you balance that? So here here's some other guidelines that I that I have people follow. And, you know, one thing, and I, I'm not going to suggest everybody go out and get one of these things, but there are, you know, the personal uh, cardiac monitors, um, the telemetry monitors, like uh, the wrist watches, like the Apple watch. Everybody, I think, every, just, I think everybody wears one of those now, don't they? But anyways, there's a, <laughs> yeah. And so on those, and it doesn't have to be the Apple Watch. There are other varieties out there, too, that aren't quite as expensive. Uh, but they are fun. They're neat. Uh, you can get your phone calls while you're exercising. But anyways, these cardiac monitors, what they do is they follow your heart rate while you are doing any, any sort of exercise. And the biggest thing about your heart rate, and this is where it gets a little bit interesting, is that there are formulas that have been written over several years to... Uh, to guide what your heart rate should be when you are exercising. I mean, if you if you want to follow this, you can take the number 220, 220, subtract your age, and then multiply that number by 0 0.70, and then 220 minus your age again, and then multiply that number by 0.80. So that, those resulting numbers are intensity levels of your exercise. 
And so 220 minus your age, that's your theoretical maximum heart rate. And then if you multiply that by 0.7, that gives you the lower heart rate, the minimal heart rate that someone should achieve while they are doing some sort of cardiovascular exercise. And then the 0.8 of 220 minus your age multiplied by 0.8, that, that's the upper number. So in between those two numbers, so you want to stay between 70% and 80% of your maximum heart rate. And if you're utilizing one of those telemetry monitors or wrist monitors, heart rate monitors, that's easy to see when you're exercising. That'll help you gauge if you're doing not enough or too much, if your heart rate um, is outside of those limits. Now, you don't have to have one of those heart rate monitors to do it. You can easily take your fingers and feel for your pulse at your carotid artery. The only issue with following at your carotid artery is that you have to satiate your activity to get an accurate count. And so what you would do, you'd find your pulse, you'd count your pulse for 10 seconds, and then you would multiply that number by six, and that will give you your heart rate for one minute. Okay? That's a great tip, thank you. And that's, yeah. Yeah, so I'm just looking through here. Let's just talk a little bit about the resistance training. Um, since I know that's an important part of the muscle strength. Yes. So the resistance training, you know, once again, increasing your muscle mass. And, you know, it goes all the way back to what we talked about before. Increasing your mu muscle mass helps you to uh, maintain your balance, maintain your metabolism, maintain your glucose levels, all of those things. Now, how do you start with your resistance training? You know, once again, um, uh, for most of us, we would probably be pretty successful doing a total body exercise. And once again, focusing on the large muscle groups of your body, your legs, your back, your chest, your shoulders, your arms, to include your biceps and triceps. Now, what type of weight, what type of resistance training? You know, it probably depends on your comfort level. And there are so many different types of resistance training. You know, you can have your free weights. And the free weights are those, you know, that we classify as dumbbells and barbells, where you go into the gym and you hear them clanking around and you see the big muscle head guys lifting them all over the place and then, you know, high five and going, yeah, you can push just one more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, those are your free weights. And then there are the machine weights. And the machine weights are the resistance exercises that are based on a particular machine. Um, some of those machines, they, they will go by the same name as some of the free weight exercise, like a chest press machine or shoulder raise machine or bicep curl machine. But they are structures that are basically providing the support for the weight while you are doing the exercise. Now, for a lot of beginners, that's one of the best ways to get started because you don't have to worry about the form or the function of the exercise. The machine does all of that for you. All you have to do is just make sure the machine is sized for you. There's, uh, there are some machines in some gyms nowadays that it doesn't matter what size you are. You just sit on the machine and you start doing the weight. You don't have to adjust anything. Um, but not a lot of gyms have those. There's usually some adjustment you have to do, like a seat height adjustment or an arm position adjustment to get the most out of that exercise. Um, and then uh, other types of resistance exercises are uh, stretch bands, stretch cords, things like that. And I think Maya, I'm going to put you on the hot seat, hot seat, Maya. But I think Maya has copies of those somewhere. I know, I might. It, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there are several di types, you know, I used to give, uh, uh, I still love these exercises, I, I will do them myself, 
but the 7.5 minute workout and it's all done with stretch bands uh, stretch bands and stretch cords you can do a uh, full body exercise resistance training exercise in about seven and a half minutes and you know truthfully you could probably do it in five minutes if you really know the exercises really well and if you develop a flow for those exercises and then of course another type of exercise is just body uh, body weight exercises we used to call them calisthenics <laughs> if you're as old as I am, you probably know what I mean. But now they call them core exercises or they call them um, hit exercises or whatever. But they're calisthenics. And those are things like jumping jacks, push-ups, crunches. Um, let's see. The big, the fun one that people do nowadays is called the burpee. I didn't even know what a burpee was until like 10 years ago, but it's the same thing as what is known as a squat thrust. That's what we used to do, you know, when I was in high school and, you know, on the soccer team. And then when I was in the army, it was called the squat thrust. Then all of a sudden the name changed to burpees. I'm not sure who thought that up, but um, let's see. What's another good. Yeah. No, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, oh, I was just going to say things like uh, air squats, lunges, wall sits. All of those are fantastic resistance, body, uh, body resistant exercises. Yeah. Okay. And I know we just went over the intensity because that was, that was really good information on there. Right. Um, so, and, so they can go back and to review that yeah. as well. Oh, actually that right there. This is good. This is good. So, Yes. So going back to intensity, you know, we talked about the 220 minus your age, but you know, if you're not mathematically inclined, <laughs> which you don't have to be to exercise, you don't have to count your laps. You don't have to count your time. You don't have to count your heart rate. The RPE chart rating a perceived effort or rating a perceived exertion chart and very simple. Just put a number line in your head. One to 10. One being no exercise at all. You're sitting on the couch watching TV to 10. The hardest thing uh, that you've ever done. I couldn't tell you what that is because it's all relative anyways. But when you exercise, you want to be somewhere about the 7 to 8 rating. Okay? Vigorous. Well, sometimes even 4 to 6. Now, on that scale... You kind of want to utilize your time to the fullest as well. If you only have five minutes to exercise, go with a little bit higher intensity. If you have an hour, hour and a half, two hours to exercise, go a little bit on the lower scale of that activity. And that's the whole purpose of it. It's great that you want to work out really hard but it's at the detriment to the exercise, meaning you won't be able to maintain that exercise for any length of time. Now, if you have a short period of time to exercise, I'm sorry, if you want to have a, if you have a long period of time to exercise, go with a little bit more moderate activity so that you can maximize that time. I think I just restated myself, didn't I? I wanted to say it the opposite direction. But anyways, um, if you only have a short period of time, go a little bit higher intensity. Okay? Excellent. So, and that's these charts actually help that. Good. And then, like I said at the very, very beginning, exercise is not that one-off thing. It's not that check your box for the week. Okay, I exercised on Tuesday. I'm done. It's not that. It's something that should become part of your lifestyle. Something, find that time of day that's good for you. Morning, noon, night, just before you go to bed, just before you wake. Well, I guess you can't do it before you wake up, but just after you wake up in the morning. A lot of times that is, uh, you have to find your time to exercise. Um, you might be a solitary exerciser. Uh, you might only want to do it by yourself, uh, or you might need a group. Sometimes exercising in a group is very helpful. The group provides a lot of motivation. Uh, the only issue with a lot with a group is sometimes the group 
dynamics. Uh, there are a lot of different goals within a group, and it might not be appropriate for the goals you're trying to achieve. But whatever gets you out there is what you want to do. And, you know, and it's okay to treat yourself too. You know, after good exercise, you know, treat yourself with a massage or treat yourself with a, I don't know, something just to give you that positive reinforcement for have done that particular exercise bout. Yeah. And I, I have found both exercise independently along with also some small groups has been really helpful for me when I'm trying to push myself, you know, sometimes you need other people around you to sort of rally. So, so that can exactly. definitely be really helpful. So yeah. Mike, I just want to thank you. I know that was the end of your presentation and we will share this as well with anyone who was registered uh, for the program so that they can go back and review that. Um, but Thanks. really for diving in and really sharing not just uh, what muscle, you know, how to get improve your muscle strength, but why it's important right. uh, and, and, and getting to the root of that is really was was wonderful information. So I want to thank you so much. We had a couple of people who have said this was great information. Um, they really enjoyed it. So Excellent. thank you for being here today, Mike. On Wednesday, we do have another presentation coming up, and that is going to be the formula uh, to build healthy bones. That'll be on at 10 a.m. Uh, so we look forward to seeing everyone back then. Thanks again, right. Mike. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks for having